Hi everyone, welcome to my uh, series, Extreme Feats of Memory. Um, I like to memorize stuff, and today I will be um, quoting pages one to three, and hopefully some of four, of Edward Gibbon's History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. So, <clears throat> here we go. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. The extent and military force of the empire in the age of the Antonines. In the second century of the Christian era, the empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilized portion of mankind. The frontiers of that extensive monarchy were guarded with ancient renown and disciplined valor. The gentle but powerful influence of laws and manners had gradually cemented the union of the provinces. The peaceful inhabitants enjoyed and abused the advantages of wealth and luxury. The image of a free constitution was preserved with decent reverence. The Roman Senate seemed to possess the sovereign authority and devolved on the emperors all the executive powers of government. During a happy period, AD 98, 180, of more than fourscore years. The public administration was conducted by the virtue and ability of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the two Antonines. It is the design of this and of the two succeeding chapters to describe the prosperous condition of their empire. And afterward, from the death of Marcus Antoninus, to deduce the most important circumstances of its decline and fall. A revolution which will never be remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. The initial conquests of the Roman Empire were achieved under the Republic, and the emperors, for the most part, were satisfied with preserving those dominions which had been acquired by the policy of the Senate, the active emulation of the consuls, and the martial enthusiasm of the people. The seven first centuries were filled with a rapid succession of triumphs, but it was reserved for Augustus to relinquish the ambitious design of subduing the whole earth, and to introduce a spirit of moderation into the public councils. Inclined to peace by his temper and situation, it was easy for him to discover that Rome, in her present exalted situation, had much less to hope than to fear from the chance of arms. And that in the prosecution of remote wars, the undertaking became every day more difficult, the possession more precarious and less beneficial. The experience of Augustus added weight to these salutary reflections. And, by the prudent vigour of his counsels, effectually convinced him that it would be easy to secure every concession which the safety and dignity of Rome might require from the most formidable barbarians. Instead of exposing his person and his legions to the arrows of the Parthians, he obtained by honourable treaty, by an honourable treaty, the restitution of the standards and prisoners which had been taken at the defeat of Crassus. In the early part of his reign, his generals attempted the reduction of Ethiopia and Arabia Felix. They marched near a thousand miles to the south of the tropic. But the heat of the climate soon repelled the invaders and protected the unwarlike uh, natives of those sequestered regions. The northern countries of Europe scarcely deserved the expense and labour of military conquest. The forests and morasses of Germany were filled with a hardy race of barbarians who despised life when it was separated from freedom. And though after the first attack they seemed to yield to the weight of the Roman power, they soon, in a single act of despair, regained their independence and reminded Augustus of the vicissitude of fortune. On the death of that emperor, his testimony was publicly read in the Senate. He bequeathed as a valuable legacy to his uh, successors 
the advice of confining the empire within those limits, limits which nature seemed to have placed as its permanent bulwarks and boundaries. On the north, sorry, on the west, the Atlantic Ocean, the Rhine and Danube on the north, the Euphrates on the east, and towards the south, the sandy deserts of Arabia and Africa. Happily for the repose of mankind, the moderate system recommended by the wisdom of Augustus was adopted by the virtue and abilities of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the two Antonines. Engaged in the pursuit of pleasure and the exercise of tyranny, the first Caesars seldom showed themselves to the soldiers or to the provinces. Nor were they disposed to suffer that those triumphs which their indolence neglected should be usurped by the valour and conduct of their lieutenants. The military fame of a subject was considered an insolent invasion of the imperial prerogative, and it became the duty as well as interest of every Roman general to, to guard the frontier, the frontiers which had been entrusted to his care, without aspiring to conquests which might have proved no less fatal to himself than to the vanquished barbarians. The only accession which the Roman Empire received during the first century of the Roman Empire, or during the first century of the Christian era, was the province of Britain. In this single instance, the successors of Caesar and Augustus were persuaded to follow the example of the former rather than the precept of the latter. The proximity of its situation to the coast of Gaul seemed to invite their arms, and the doubtful, though and the pleasing, though doubtful, intelligence of a pearl fishery attracted their avarice. And as Britain was viewed in the light of a distinct and insulated world, the conquest scarcely formed any exception to the general system of continental measures. After a war of about 40 years, undertaken by the most stupid, maintained by the most dissolute, and terminated by the most timid of all the emperors, the far greater part of the island submitted to the Roman yoke. The various tribes of Britain, Britons possessed valour without conduct, and the love of freedom without the spirit of union. They took up arms with savage fierceness, and laid them down or turned them against each other with wild inconstancy. And while they fought singly, they were successively subdued. Neither the fortitude of Cracticus, nor the despair of Boadicea, nor the fanaticism of the Druids could avert the slavery of their country, or the steady progress of the imperial generals who maintained the national glory when the throne was in, when the throne was disgraced by the weakest or the most vicious of mankind at the very time when Domitian confined to his palace felt the terrors which he, ins he himself inspired his legions under the command of the virtuous agricola defeated the collected forces of the Caledonians at the foot of the Grampian Hills. And his fleets, venturing a unknown and dangerous navigations, displayed the Roman arms around every part of the island. The conquest of Britain was considered as already achieved, and it was the design of Agricola to complete an insurer's success by the easy reduction of Ireland for which, in his opinion, one legion and a few auxiliaries would be sufficient. The Western Isle would be improved into a valuable uh, possession, and the Britons would wear their chains with a less reluctance if the example and prospect of freedom were on every side removed from before their eyes. And that's it. That's all I remember at the moment, um, I think. So that was actually uh, page one and two thirds of, right through uh, to two thirds of page four. So uh, thanks for watching. Um, 
and please um, keep an eye on this channel and watch some of my other memory videos if you um, like this sort of thing. Uh, don't forget to like, share and subscribe and um, keep an eye out for my next video and hopefully I'll get further than page 4, page 5, page 6, who knows. It does take a while. So, yeah. Have a nice day.